Hello! Welcome to part 2 of the Fire Emblem Sync Marathon. This part, we'll be looking at what makes a good starting cast of units, using these chapters as reference from each mainline title. Some highlights will be Gaiden and Shadows of Valentia, where we promote the villagers, New Mystery, where Ryan proves to be just as useful as Sheeta, and Three Houses, where we choose the best house and try to make Caspar work in Maddening's Chapter 1. When analyzing the starting casts, I'm not just looking at how strong the units are, but how well designed they are, as a grouping of units that function as the introduction to the strategic, fun gameplay of Fire Emblem. To judge this, my three main qualifiers are as follows. Characters that are engaging and make the player want to use them, competent gameplay performance, and overall entertainment value. With this in mind, let's go ahead and get started. Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light on their journey to Orleans, Marth's army is joined by our new mercenary crew, who helps them fight past a group of pirates in Garda. Our new recruits include Agma, a mercenary with immediately strong combat, along with the fighter trio of Bartz, Maji, and Saji. Along the way, we also recruit the pirate Daros and the hunter Kashim. This makes for a pretty expansive opening cast, and at first I was honestly a bit overwhelmed since they all start together in one giant group next to a similarly large group of enemies. Thankfully, the map played out a lot differently than I was expecting, and it actually forced me to use the entire cast. I started off by leaving Ogma and Kane to fight the first group of enemies, with Marth in the back ready to recruit Daros. They did a little worse than I was expecting, with neither one rounding the pirates, and Kane taking a solid amount of damage from being attacked so many times. I decided to have Gordon stick back as well to speed up the process, but it ultimately meant that Ogma couldn't catch up with the rest of the group until the very end. I also left Kane behind for the entire map, who was busy fighting a grudge match with this one thief who kept going back and forth between the fort and forests, with Kane always missing the lethal blow. This proved to be a humorous but fruitless endeavor, as Kane was not even able to get the kill by the time Marth was ready to seize. In the west, I led with Doga and Abel at the southern and northern bridges, respectively, not trusting Jaden after the kills he stole in the last part. This also didn't go as smoothly as I expected, since the pirates can just walk past the choke point, and Abel quickly found himself at low HP. I tried to just defeat the pirates before they could attack a second time, but Abel and Cheetah refused to land their attacks, so I had to call upon the power of Bartz, Maji, and Saji to clear out the enemies. They may not be very fast or accurate, but in this moment they pulled through as units that can technically do damage. After taking care of the pirates, I was able to handle the cavaliers much more easily, since they actually followed the choke point rules. This moment shows off something that I like about Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light's starting cast. It feels like all units are able to contribute. The enemies are pretty weak, so if you want to use a unit, they can perform well enough. You're also encouraged to use most, if not all the units, as you still need to team up for kills, and the enemies are in fairly large groups. I also can appreciate how these units establish the archetypes for early game units in the rest of the series, such as a temporarily strong paladin, a pair of cavaliers, a pair of fighters, and a weak archer. That being said, I don't really love much else about this cast. The limited visual style and introduction to the characters really hurts how much I got attached to them, and many of the units are largely indistinguishable from their counterparts, such as with Kane and Abel. Also, as we've seen with Daros and Kashim, you get even more duplicates as the game progresses, which mechanically serves to aid with the permadeath aspect of the series, but also makes using the early game units feel worse, knowing that everyone is replaceable. I noticed this most with Kashim's recruitment, in which all my efforts in training the weak, low-leveled Gordon were made irrelevant, with Kashim having similar, if not better, combat, and an extra point of movement that actually lets him keep up with the rest of the army. Disregarding the duplicates, some units just didn't feel fun on their own, including the fighters with their low speed and hit. At least these first maps encourage the player to try out using the new units, so you can decide for yourself which units you would like to continue to use. Or maybe I should say, which classes you would like to use, as the units themselves aren't incredibly distinguishable. With basically all the enemies defeated, Jigen and Doga provoked Kashim, letting Shida safely recruit him, with Marth being able to reach the village on the same turn. Impressed by the fighters having a non-zero amount of contributions, I actually bought a couple axes at the armory to balance out their inventories. While the boss was too far for Agma or Gordon to help out, Jigen and Abel were able to get the kill, just in time for Marth to seize.
guided. As a side mission, Alms Group now heads to Thief Shrine, where a Milla idol that will let our units promote awaits. To reach the idol, we first have to traverse a dungeon, which brings back the same overworld exploration demonstrated in Ram Village. This layout is very simple, leading us directly to an encounter of brigands. The fight is also simple, just having five weak brigands in an open room, but it serves as an opportunity to get Robin and Cliff to level 3. The standout element is that the enemies still have healing AI, but with no actual heal tile, they just sit in place. Thanks for wasting a turn, guys. After the battle, the layout leads us directly to the idol room. Here we meet the cleric, Silk. Healing hasn't been super relevant in these early battles, but it'll be great as maps get bigger, and if she gets trained to higher levels, she'll unlock some very important utility spells. The idol room also introduces fountains, in which you can choose a unit to get various stat boosts. Typically, there are two different options, in which you get three uses total. I use these fountains to give two points of speed to Silk, and one to Cliff. Of course, the highlight of the room is the idol itself, which gives the opportunity for units to promote if they've reached the appropriate level. Because we've been setting up kills for Robin and Cliff, we can now promote all the villagers. In Gaiden, the idol randomly offers one of the five options, and if you want a different option, you have to decline and talk to the idol again. I plan to roll with the random picks and get a wacky combination like Knight Cliff or Cavalier Grey, but I ended up getting the canon choices that are already most fitting for the characters, so we've now got Mercenary Grey, Archer Robin, and Mage Cliff. A little basic by the game standards, but I know that many people would argue against Mage Cliff, and potentially even Archer Robin, and I hope that I can show all the benefits of these underrated options. Moving on to the main journey, we encounter another group of brigands. This time, their composition is a little more dynamic, featuring an archer amidst their group, along with a super tanky mercenary that menacingly charges at you through the mountain, rather than wrapping around with everyone else. For my strategy, I just ignored the mercenary at first, running all my units towards the brigands. Defeating them wasn't really super involved, since Alm, Luca, and Grey all just have standard combat. I tried to give kills to Silk, since she doesn't get XP from healing, but her only offensive spell is Nosferatu, which is capped at 60 hit, and she only landed one of her first 8 attacks. Cliff had a similarly frustrating time with his spells, since he actually would have needed 2 speed fountains to double, and his fire spell is still capped at 80 hit. Once I was only left with a few enemies stuck in healing AI, the mercenary finally caught up and was approaching from the starting positions. The physical units all do 1 damage, but any mage can do solid damage, so I set up a diagonal wall to keep Cliff safe as he chipped them down twice, with Silk clutching out the kill with her 50 hit Nasiratu. Overall, I think Gaiden has a very unique cast thanks to its incorporation of the villager characters. Their training arc to reach level 3 within the first couple encounters encouraged tactical gameplay right from the start, and their performance against the brigands is perfectly reasonable. It also makes the early map stand out, as there's not really any other game that sees such an immediate payoff to taking the early game seriously, and not just sweeping with the powerful Jagan-like units. Also, the introduction sequence in Ram Village gives the characters a little more flavor, and the more limited cast as a whole helps characters stand out. Of course, the standout aspect is once you get past the first maps and reach the branching promotions. Having the Milla Idol suggestion option, rather than freely choosing, is a little frustrating, but at least you can decline until getting the suggestion you want. The options all play very differently, so it really feels like you're getting a unique but still balanced experience for the rest of the game. Mage stands out to me as the most fun, and its power is immediately demonstrated against the mercenary in Ram Valley. The fact that combat is so simplistic does take away from some of this excitement, however. Alm, Luca, and the mercenary all function very similarly, and I don't necessarily feel the most strategic using them now that there's not an obvious training arc. I am trying to give Silk some kills, but that has its own problems thanks to Nosferatu's low hits. For the early game, I think Silk is still going to feel pretty bad, but just you wait until she gets warped. In about five parts from now. Mystery of the Emblem Marth's army now moves to rescue Minerva, an ally told to have taken rule over the city of Madan after the events of Fe1, who has been imprisoned following a coup. Fittingly, this chapter features enemy Draco Knights as the main threatening force, with a boss that threatens a large range around the castle, and a generic Draco Knight on each side if you choose to wrap around the central forest. The eastern path is the one of least resistance, and you can easily handle the enemies as they come to you. If you push through the forests and go through the western path, you have the opportunity to chase down a thief that drops a lady sword. 
conceptually, this all sounds like an interesting idea for a map. In practice, it ended up being one of, if not the most insufferable experiences I've had in this marathon so far. The forests take an incredible three points of movement to traverse, and most of your units need to cross one or two just to make it to the western path. You can technically swap around starting positions by changing the deployment order, but you can't actually see which slot aligns with which position until starting the map. The Thief also has a huge lead on your units, and I fully believed that you had to defeat them turn 3 before they moved into range of the boss, who the Cavaliers have no chance to defeat on their own. This would still result in drawing over the generic Dragonite, which the Cavaliers would struggle to defeat while already being surrounded by all the enemy Cavaliers and soldiers. It took me countless resets to realize you can actually just have the Cavaliers continue up a path in the northwest and cut the Thief off right before it escapes. This is a little unintuitive, and it's still difficult to get the archers to keep up and be able to help with the following Draco Knight fight. I leave Gordon in range of the Draco Knight, drawing it away from the Cavaliers and towards the rest of my army. From there, it takes all three archers to shoot it down, but my Gordon crit, giving the obnoxious Draco Knight exactly what it deserves. Disregarding the thief escape sequence, the rest of the map is actually alright, if not a bit boring. At the beginning of the map, the Pegasus Knight Katria joins our army, and you can have her recruit an enemy hunter, Warren. Katria is solid against the Cavaliers and Soldiers while being able to actually move around in the forest, and Warren is necessary for the Draco Knight 3 shots alongside Gordon and Ryan. It takes a long time to either wrap around or push through the forests, but killing the enemies isn't actually very difficult. You do have to be cautious to not get in range of the boss until all the archers are able to reach him, though. After doing so, it takes Marth another several turns to either wrap around or push through the forests to reach the seize point, which is no longer being protected. As much as I'd like to look past my terrible experience with Mystery of the Emblem's map so far, I have to admit that they heavily impact the vibes of its starting cast. The combat is basic, bordering on frustrating, as the controls make it difficult to make calculations, and the Cavaliers have to waste time dismounting to use the more accurate swords and be able to actually cross terrain. Pairing this unenticing combat with tedious maps, the units don't get a chance to have any of their best features highlighted. This is most obvious with the archers, who can't move across the mountains at all in Chapter 1, and struggle to reach any combat in Chapter 2, in which they are actually necessary. Drog also gets left behind, but his combat doesn't even feel all that great. Marth's combat and movement are at least passable, but he's still kind of boring. The best parts of this opening cast are the mounted units, despite how much I griped on the dismounting mechanic. Luke and Cecile's combat may be standard, but they at least have the potential to switch around a wide variety of weapons depending on the situation, and their high movement makes them feel fun in a fast-paced approach. I also appreciate Katria for having decent combat while actually being able to cross the terrain unrestricted, but being known for being able to move around the map is a bit sad. In fairness of Mystery of the Emblem, the improved visual style does make the cast easier to be invested in as a whole. After all, I wouldn't like Luke nearly as much if he just had a recolored design shared amongst two other units. Also, the necessity to use the weak early game archers to get past the map is certainly iconic, and I won't be quick to forget it. Genealogy of the Holy War Having successfully fought off Verdane's invasion of Granville, Sigurd now takes the offensive in an attempt to rescue Ideen, a noblewoman and priest whose capture was the instigating event of the prologue. This is a very pressing matter, so of course the first thing we do is spend an hour shopping in the town. <laughs> Here we can finally find a way to trade items by having one unit sell them to the pawnbroker and another purchase them back. This not only restricts trading to when a unit is at a castle, but also makes trading expensive items like the speed ring a pretty big investment. Luckily, we now have unlocked the arena, in which units can fight to earn experience and gold. If a unit loses, they are left at 1 HP, but if you save before every fight like I do, you can reset and try as many times as you need to. Each unit can go through the 7 levels of the arena once per chapter, and although not many units can get past Chapter 1's Myrmidon at the 4th level, Units get more capable, and the cast gets bigger as the game progresses, so the arena will take even longer in the future than the hour I spent here. Due to the extensive length of genealogy maps, from now on I will only be covering a castle or two each part. In this part, I will seize both Genoa and Marfa, 
and in the next, I will take on Verdane Castle itself. Janela has two waves to it. First, Sigurd's group fights Kinbaith and his densely packed rectangle of fighters and archers. The fighters aren't a huge deal, as they have terrible hit against all your sword units, and Sigurd can always sweep them if necessary. The archers are a bit more annoying, as most of your units can't counterattack or one round them. An exception is Finn, who doubles with the speed ring. He also boasts the skill Miracle, which, in short, can give him a huge avoid boost when at low HP. Using this strategy, I have Finn kill the first fighters all in one enemy phase, kill the remaining archers on player phase, and finally kill Kinbaith himself on the following player phase. Finn, Sigurd, Quan, Alec, and even Ethlyn carry a lot of the work, since they have the movement to quickly intercept Kinbaith's group, and all face low hit rates from the fighters. Meanwhile, units like Azel are stuck in the back, unable to keep up and being too frail to warrant letting the enemies come to you all at once. After a turn, Ideen shows up, isolated in the southern portion of the map with the thief, Du. In a twist of fate, we now control a thief that is running away, but unlike our cavaliers in Mystery of the Emblem, these brigands have no hope to catch up. I do leave Du behind at one point, since if he fights an enemy, he can steal their gold, and he's perfectly safe in a forest, in which the enemies will have zero hit on him. Ideen and Du's job is just to buy time until the main army can rescue them after seizing Genoa. Perhaps the most challenging aspect of seizing Genoa comes in its second wave. Ira is pretty strong, and while it wouldn't be too challenging to just kill her with Sigurd and Quan, you can recruit her after seizing. This means you need to lure her away from the seize point before Sigurd accidentally kills her, but she is also likely to kill whoever lures her away, especially since she has a chance to proc Astra and get an additional 4 attacks. The solution to this is usually having Alec distract her, since his Nihil ability prevents Ira from proccing Astra. My Alec was on low HP though, so I had to have Sigurd and Alec wrap around her, and even then, Sigurd had to risk a combat with her. Thankfully, she did not proc Astra, and I was able to seize the next turn, recruiting Ira the following turn. With Ira recruited and Ideen just about saved, we can now start considering Genealogy's pairing system, in which most female and male units can marry each other if they get enough love points. The love point system is actually pretty complicated, but the method to get the pairings of your choosing is ironically simple, having them wait next to each other for a large amount of turns. The pairings we choose will be very important later on, specifically with the female units, so we now have the added goal of getting Ira, Ideen, and any future female recruits paired up with our male unit of choosing. I don't quite have my Ideen pairing planned out yet, but I do attempt to get the Ira and Dude pairing started by having them stand next to each other during these last handful of turns. After seizing, our scheduled genealogy gameplay is interrupted by Sigurd's ally Eldigan, who fends off an enemy cavalry group that got the funny idea to seize our home castle while we're away. Arden could have taken them, of course, being sturdy as a brick wall and strong as an ox, but Eldigan takes it upon himself to take them out with his own cavalry. It takes quite some time, but I don't mind it, as it serves as an interesting blend of gameplay and narrative, and we will have our fair share of even longer allied army phases to come. Back to our scheduled gameplay, the rest of the army makes their way to the south, setting up kills for Azel and Finn against the enemies who huddled up around Dew. Like Azel at the beginning of the chapter, Ira struggled to catch up before all the enemies were dead, but I was still able to get her a kill or two. I attempted to have Finn perform the same miracle sweep against the second group of enemies guarding Morpha, but I did not realize that these brigands were stronger, and Finn was not able to one round since I hadn't given him the steel lance. This made for an extremely messy turn, where I tried to kill a bunch of the remaining enemies on player phase, but I did not have nearly enough firepower. Against all odds though, Finn got extremely lucky on the following enemy phase, and I was able to defeat the group without any resets. From there, it just took a couple turns to have everyone rush the western forest, while Sigurd caught up and seized after setting up the boss skill for Azel. While genealogy is known to devolve into Sigurd killing everything, I think that the starting cast actually has a strong start if you give them the chance. I personally am not a huge fan of the art style when it comes to the big fluffy hairstyles, but otherwise I think the designs are all great and help the characters stand out. 
Gameplay-wise, they are all usable right away, with the prologue giving many of them specific moments to shine, like with Azel one-rounding the brigands, and Alec and Noish perfectly teaming up for kills. While there is repetition with the many cavaliers, they distinguish themselves in their skills, weapon type, and meaningful differences in stats. Of course, the cavaliers bring their own problem into the mix. Their movement is just so much better than the infantry units, and with the amazing canto that lets them use the rest of their movement after most every action, they can easily leave the infantry units in their dust, killing the enemies before giving them a chance to contribute. This is a bit of an exaggeration, but it is notable that while units like Azel and Ira are fun to use in battle, you have to hold yourself back a little to make sure they can see a lot of combat. Arden is even worse, having less movement and physically taking a long time to move with the slow walking animation. Du's unique utility as a gold stealing thief is fun, but without Kanto, he does struggle to safely steal a ton without actively going out of your way for it. Meanwhile, Sigurd and the Cavaliers can quickly move around the map, creating a disparity between how fun it is to use the starting cast, even if you don't strictly care about turn counts. When playing a bit more casually, this disparity isn't huge though, and I still think that this is an all-around fun, colorful cast. Hopefully I can show off in the next part that Azel and Ira are indeed usable, and you don't need Sigurd to do everything. Thracia 776 During their pursuit to rescue Marita and Nana from monsters Duke Raedric, Leaf's group stops to protect the coastal village of Iz from a group of pirates. This turns out to be quite the simple task, with the pirates being all around pretty weak and inaccurate, and you have several turns to get to the villages before they're threatened. Like Chapter 1, this map seems to give an opportunity to get used to capturing, and the additional axes are certainly appreciated amongst our warrior and three fighters. It also features the new archer, Ronin, after visiting the northern village. He immediately has a couple archers he can fight, but his performance is already a little lacking. He does two round them, but not with great accuracy. My Ronin hit exactly two out of four attacks against the archer with the vulnerary, causing them to heal before the exact same thing happened again. This technically meant Ronin got more weapon XP, but it was a little sad. Despite only needing a couple units to visit the villages in the east, I sent Eivul alone to the north to recruit Ronin, with everyone else wrapping around the east. This gives more opportunities for captures and leaf kills, but this definitely is a map where the two opportunities are at odds with one another. There are reinforcements, but they are always in waves of three, and many times I was able to capture all of them, but had to choose to disregard the capture to let leaf get the kill for all of 20 XP. I did wait for all the reinforcements to come, so I got a decent mixture of both, but it still felt awkward each time. Meanwhile, on the north, Eivul just barely didn't kill the boss, setting up a kill for Finn. Dagger can capture the boss for a couple steel weapons, but my dagger was way too far to reach by the time I was ready for Leaf to cease. After saving the coastal village, our new tactician, Augustus, guides us to our first additional guide and map, in which we will finish off the pirates at their base, the Corsair Isles. This is our first Fog of War chapter of the Marathon, in which you can only see the map a few tiles away from each of your units. Thracia takes this to the extreme, displaying tiles outside your range with complete black, so you don't even know what the upcoming terrain is like. You can circumvent this by using torches, and the chapter attempts to make this dynamic interesting by putting a torch on a warrior, which you can capture with Dagdar or Finn. The torch certainly helps, but is actually a little difficult to obtain, and its limited uses makes it only useful for a handful of turns in this fairly extensive map. I have Ajin, Dagdar, Ronin, and Tanya wrap around the optional west path to get some kills and captures. Ajin is proving to be very strong, with his wrath skill and FCM stat making him crit basically everything on the enemy phase. Hoffen does well enough on the eastern path though, which is great since Finn and Marty got left behind thanks to the annoying sand tiles. I take the map a little slower than necessary, waiting at choke points rather than pushing forward in case a large group of enemies is waiting. This usually isn't the case, but there are a couple moments where Leaf or the Archers could die if you just sent them out on their own. Despite the unique touches like skills and the crit manipulating FCM stat, I actually think that Thracia's starting cast is off to a weak start. So far, there just hasn't been anything exciting for them to do, as the first maps only feature a handful of weak enemies so you can get used to capturing. 
This also creates many scenarios in which you have to choose between training low-leveled units like Leaf and Ronin, or getting the capture with an over-leveled unit like Dagdar. There are enough enemies to where you can just get a few captures and be fine, but I found it to make for an unsatisfying moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, which harmed my image of the units. I now have a grudge against Dagdar for stealing kills from Ronin for something as basic as an Iron Axe, and I view Leaf as even bigger of a training project than he should be. Avil is also way overkill on most enemies, and has a sizable crit chance against the few enemies she could actually weaken, making her feel brainless, not contributing to any overall strategy. Like genealogy though, the characters all have fairly fun, unique designs, so it's easy to want to give someone a training arc, as unsatisfying as it may be early on. Despite having four axe users, they all stand out through their skills and meaningful stat differences, for better or worse in Marty's case. Ronan and Tanya are kind of similar to be fair, but they appeal to different types of players, and Ronan has a couple silly gimmicks that will become prevalent as I continue to use him. After pushing past the middle bridge, I left Ajin and Ronin behind to get some kills against reinforcements. I haven't been commenting on many units' level ups in this marathon, but I have to acknowledge Ronin's level 3 growth. Just defense may not seem great, but after transitioning back to the map, we see that Ronin also increased his movement stat. While the percent is very low, units in Thracia certainly have a chance to get more movement, a mechanic unprecedented in the series. It won't actually be too crazy for Ronin as an archer, but it's certainly fun. Back to the ending, Halvin and Finn lead the charge to the boss in the north. We get a glimpse at a threatening Myrmidon, but since we've gone relatively fast, he is still immobile, and we can go right for the boss, a thief named Lyphus. Because he has no weapons equipped, we can actually capture him without needing to deal a lethal blow, easily opening up the seize point for Leaf. Here we find the cleric, Safi, and she convinces us to let Lyphus join our group as well. Binding Blade. After saving his father, Eliwood, from bandits, Roy goes to meet a mercenary crew hired by Eliwood, but gets swept into a battle to save the Princess of Burn, Guinevere, who is being held captive by Lycian forces. This news was brought to us by Ellen, Guinevere's vassal and the cleric that finally gives Roy's army a consistent source of healing. Sadly for her, she gets one shot by the first fighters in the map, and I was not able to kill them right away having underestimated their strength and sending Marcus to get the village and houses. As such, I had to use rescue for the first time, not for any cool movement tech, but to prevent the enemies from killing one of my units. I quickly realized my mistake and sent Marcus back to help with the combat, sending our new convoy on wheels unit, Merlinus, to get the villages and houses instead. I was thankfully able to get Lance onto the fort at the choke point turn 2, keeping everyone safe from the next wave of enemies. During this process, I continued my efforts from Chapter 1 to get as many kills for Roy and Walt as possible. After a turn, Roy's mercenary crew shows up in the east, consisting of the mercenary Deke, the Pegasus Knight Channa, and the fighters Wade and Lot. Like Akma, Deke has a great first impression, sitting at a choke point and helping clear out a huge group of enemies. While Binding Blade's hard mode enemies are tough, Deke gets the defensive benefits of a fort, so he still does great though not quite one-rounding enemies. This is actually good though, as you get plenty of opportunities to feed kills to Shanna, who wants to promote as soon as possible to unlock access to swords. Wade and Lot contribute by completing the choke point and rescue dropping Shanna to safety after attacking. Overall, Binding Blade's cast seems to be the most standard. The combat of the game is simple, but not too boring as teaming up for kills can be pretty intensive, and Rescue Drop adds some overall movement tech. The units are all functionally pretty similar though, wanting to be able to take a couple hits and deal enough damage to two or three shot enemies. Walt is perhaps the most unique of the Chapter 1 cast, providing two range attacks and creating a gameplay where you have to protect him from getting attacked at one range. Deke stands out by actually having good combat which, to be fair, is a little skewed by his introduction at a choke point with forts. Shanna's fight utility is also great to have early, and even though it wasn't relevant here, 
Setting up a training arc for her is nice in giving a specific goal to accomplish in the early game. Finding Blade is known for its less balanced cast, and that certainly is notable even as early as Chapter 2. Roy and Wolt are already not dealing great damage, Boris is inaccurate and not great at tanking, and the fighter's hit rates are even worse. If you like a unit, you can certainly train them to be usable, but the limited story doesn't give players much reason to get invested in a character past their design. This typically makes for a poor first impression of a unit like Wolt, who many players bench for a similar but stronger unit that replaces them later on. So despite having average performance and serviceable designs, I don't think the starting cast is all that great in the end. Back to Chapter 2, Roy's group catches up with Deke right about when they're finished with their first wave of enemies, using Rescue Drop to get the low movement Roy and Wolt there faster. I take the final area to give more kills to Roy and Chenna, baiting enemies one or two at a time with the Cavaliers. I even trap an archer against the edge of the screen, which was really funny, especially considering that, in-universe, there shouldn't have been anything stopping them from taking a step to the right and moving to kill Shanna. No complaints from her, of course. Because I delayed visiting the village for several turns to also visit the houses, I had to do a huge trade chain to get the Armor Slayer to a unit who could use it to defeat the boss. As intended, I gave it to Deke, who won rounds if he lands both hits. Mine does, so Roy is able to seize right away. Blazing Blade Hector has successfully snuck out of the Palace of Ostia, but before he can meet up with his friend Eliwood, the two groups have to subdue a surprise bandit attack. Starting in the north, Hector is aided by the knight Oswin and a rather persistent cleric, Sarah. Meanwhile, in the south, Eliwood brings a rather large amount of new recruits to our army. Eliwood is an underwhelming sword-wielding lord like Roy, Rebecca is the weak archer of the group, the younger Marcus is an even stronger paladin than in Binding Blade, Lowen is a more average cavalier, and Dorcas and Bartre serve as this game's fighter duo. In the north, I move Hector and Oswin fully forward, who are both pretty tanky and do a fine job at picking off the enemy flyers before they can reach Sarah. I'm stubborn and try to move Matthew along with them to get a couple kills, which he naturally gets against the weakened Pegasus Knights. I have to reset once to find a formation in which only one flyer can reach him though, as otherwise he gets two shot by the enemies. Meanwhile, in the south, Lowen takes the lead, setting up many kills for himself and Roy. Rebecca is one of the few early game weak archers that gets a map with flyers, but she still only does about 50%, while units like Hector are doing much more without effectivity. Unfortunate for how fun she feels, but she still certainly contributes to the cause. The new units here set up what's basically another standard cast, like in Blinding Blade. Most of the unit's performance isn't particularly great outside of Marcus, but they all at least have something to contribute. A couple units in Blazing Blade's favor are Matthew and Rebecca. Matthew has unique thief utility and makes for a fun training project, and as mentioned, Rebecca stands out by actually having flyers to fight in her join map. Lowen, Eliwood, and the fighters are fairly underwhelming though, and despite Hector being conceptually cool with his unique effective axe, he also struggles with his lower hit rates and not having standard axes to use until the end of the map. At least Oswin is fun with context, knowing that he's an early game knight that actually performs well, and for much longer than the first chapter. After pushing past the first waves of enemies, I have Hector, Oswin, and Matthew stick around in the north to continue getting kills for Matthew, disregarding the fact that Matthew has the red gem and needs to sell it to be able to buy any weapons from the armory. At the last second, I have to yet again set up a trade chain to get the red gem to whoever goes shopping getting an Iron Sword for Eliwood and an Iron Axe for Hector, so they can finally stop wasting their personal effective weapons on generic enemies. Meanwhile, Lowen pushes the southern group forward, with Marcus fighting the boss as soon as they get down from the mountain, setting up the kill for Lowen. Sacred Stones. Erica and Seth have successfully escaped Gratis' attack on Renee, but on her journey to Freyla, Erica takes it upon herself to retake a fort in Magvel, 
which is harboring the Princess of Freyla, Tana. This narrative structure of heroically putting ourselves in danger for the sake of others in need is starting to sound a bit familiar at this point. As another similarity, we get some new units to help us out. Franz is a cavalier, and though he isn't nearly comparable to Seth, he certainly is strong enough to hold his own in these early chapters, and unless you get unlucky with his level ups, he can keep up the solid combat performance while having great movement. On the other hand is Gilliam, a knight with passable combat as a slow, tanky unit in the early game. His combat will only get comparably worse as the game progresses though, and his low movement makes training him unconducive to fast-paced playstyles. You might as well use him in these early chapters though, since you don't have other options, and he's good at setting up kills for other units. As for my strategy, I baited the enemies with Erika, having Seth visit the houses. This map is one of many that is so obviously beatable if you just move Seth forward and have him obliterate everything. Like the prologue though, I feel you might as well fight the enemies with Erika, exchanging perhaps a turn or two for an actually fun and thought out experience. In this map, the main concern is Erika's survivability, making sure she doesn't take on more than she can handle. If you level strength, you can one round the fighters, and while my Erika didn't, she made up for it by lending a couple crits with her rapier, which was fun. Once Franz and Gilliam join, you can either have Franz kill everything and get the best possible start for his training arc, or have Gilliam set up kills for Erika. I do both, having Franz sweep the reinforcements from the back, and Gilliam fighting with Erika up front. I wasn't confident in my calculations against the boss, so rather than trying to have Seth set up a safe kill for Erika, I just sat Erika in front of the boss, assuming she would need a couple rounds to get the kill. She continued to her crit rampage though, so I was able to save a turn and my Seth was clear of this map. With Sacred Stones being so short, our starting cast is looking really small. To give us a little more to consider, we can continue past Chapter 1 to look at the overworld. Just like we saw in Gaiden, you get to physically move the protagonist around the map, with each chapter being a new location. In Sacred Stones, you also get to go shopping and manage inventories, and we can take this opportunity to look at the couple new units that joined after Chapter 1. Vanessa is an early joining Pegasus Knight in need of a training arc like Binding Blade Shanna, and Mulder gives us our first healer. As with most healers, Mulder doesn't change how I view the opening cast, but Vanessa adds immediately useful flying utility, and while not the only low-leveled unit, she is certainly a unit that you can train to be strong. Having units with satisfying training arcs would normally make for a great opening cast, but I think Sacred Stones kind of taints this by designing Seth the way he is. Just comparing his stats to Franz and Vanessa, it's obvious that you could just have him kill all the enemies, and this can continue even to the end of the game. In my opinion, this makes all the other early joining units feel worse, as it kind of feels like there's just no reason to bother with them. I enjoy training a full team, and I like a few other early joining units, but I have to hold myself back from playing fast to do so. The low enemy quality means that everyone does perform well though, so even without Seth, you can still play in a tight, fast-paced manner. Just sucks that a dominant playstyle is always haunting you, making you feel silly for investing in any early game units you like. Path of Radiance The bandits from Chapter 1 are out for revenge, and have taken the younger siblings of our group hostage. Titania temporarily leaves the party, and against orders, Ike leads the rest of his crew on the rescue mission, including the frail cleric, Riss. Titania rejoins after a few turns, but until then, Ike's group is on its own, and the map layout forces you to play a tough defense mission, keeping Riss safe with only three combat units. I start off by having Ike and Boyd take the choke point against the three enemies in the north, while Oscar gets started on an enemy in the east. I realized that if you send someone up in range of the Myrmidon in the north as well, you can actually kill the three enemies in the north turn too, giving Riss a safe area to heal. I opted against this though, since it felt lame going out of my way to hide in an area that was even further from the boss than our starting position. This meant Riss had to take a hit, and once Titania showed up, I had her run back to help make a defensive formation around Riss, so I could continue to have all the kills go to Ike and Boyd. The right side of the map, like Sacred Stones, is obviously quickly clearable if you just move Titania forward and have her kill everything. This is especially true since Ike's group is actually kind of far away from the enemies, while Titania has high movement and starts closer. I of course had Titania just wait around, letting Ike and Boyd get the kills. Because he leveled strength and speed a couple times, Boyd was able to wander on the fighters, which was never super relevant, but could have perhaps saved a turn in this titania -less strategy.
As punishment for disobedience, Ike's next mission of driving out pirates must be completed without the help of his friends. Rather, he has to deal with Shannon, a rather unpleasant sniper. Also, Gatry is here, the knight that, like Oswin, actually fills the role of compensating low movement for high strength and bulk. This leaves our army for the map with one trainee in Ike, and three other units that are all extremely competent at killing enemies. In fairness, Gatry sets up kills for Ike, but the map encourages you to play quickly, meaning you really want to have Shannon and Titania just move forward and kill everything, which is not very tactical. The encouragement to play fast comes from Marsha, a weak Pegasus knight that, as a green unit, acts on her own. Despite starting in the middle of a bunch of pirates on a boat, she has fairly good avoid and uses a vulnerary when at low HP, so by all means you are expected to have a couple turns to react and rush Titania up to save her. In my first attempt though, Marsha didn't dodge a single attack, and she died before I even had a chance to approach the boat. The second attempt went much better, and I didn't stick around in the south as long to feed all the kills to Ike, but it still left a bad impression. This brings me to my main issue with Path of Radiance's starting cast. Much like Sacred Stones, it tries to be helpful in giving a strong unit that can get you out of bad situations. It also wants to be interesting by shifting around the units deployed in certain maps. In both cases though, the maps are specifically laid out in such a way that heavily favors having the stronger units carry all of the combat. In Chapter 2, Ike's group has some action for the first couple turns, but then are far behind Titania when it comes to the boss group. In Chapter 3, Ike is the only actual trainee, and Marsha makes sure that you can't actually feed him all the kills even if you wanted to take the map at a tedious, slow pace. I would have loved to keep using Boyd, Riss, and Oscar, but the game just replaced them with boringly strong units instead. Despite all this, Path of Radiance's cast gets a lot of credit for having solid presentation and being part of an engaging story. It's easy to get attached to Ike and his group, and even though you don't really have any other options yet, I can easily see most players wanting to make the most of these units. It's just too bad that Titania and Shannon steal the show in these early chapters, and by the time you need to use your full army, the trainees would have fallen behind if you didn't go slow for their sake. The bad feeling of forcibly going slow continued through to the end of Chapter 3, in which this boss group can be baited individually, rather than having to fight them all at once. This made it obvious that to play quickly, you need to just move Titania and Shannon forward to kill the enemies, and playing slower to give kills to units that can actually be trained felt really slow and not very engaging. I at least was able to give the boss kill to Gatry, and I can be happy knowing that the next chapter is designed around the start of a very specific training arc. Radiant Dawn. Benyon forces have driven out the Dawn Brigade from Navasa, but during their escape, Micaiah can't help but accept the Cleric Laura's request to reclaim some medicine stolen by Benyon. Soth has discovered the manner in which the medicine is being stored, but he is busy creating an escape path. This means that for the first few turns, Micaiah, Edward, Nolan, and Leonardo have to fight the enemies on their own. Thankfully, Radiant Dawn's power spike hasn't quite occurred yet, and we also now have access to saves and Laura. Healing hasn't been a huge issue due to the large amount of herbs and vulnerabilities, but she will help us push forward a bit more efficiently. This map also features the new mechanic of ledges, which cost movement to move across, but can provide a combat bonus if fighting at the height advantage. These will be interesting later on, but for now, I just ignore the first ledge, wrapping around the east. I continue my efforts to set up kills for Micaiah and Edward, but Leonardo is quickly falling behind in his ability to provide meaningful combat contributions, and Nolan's hit rates are not ideal. As such, I have a couple of risky turns where Leonardo has to take a hit at a choke point, and I resort to looking up enemy AI. Some of the enemies in the boss room will not move, but if you don't know this, then you have to be constantly worried that they might jump down from the ledge and pick off a weakened unit. Knowing the AI though, I was able to move fairly fast and get to the middle of the stage around the time Soth shows up. He starts away from the army, and one look at him shows that he is meant to be a unit like Seth or Titania, who can obviously destroy a whole section of the map on his own. This map actually makes interesting use of such a unit, however, by placing Soth next to a large cluster of enemies that are far away from the main army. Furthermore, the main army already has other objectives, such as getting the chest room in the opposite corner of the boss, 
so having Soth clear the way for Laura to reach her final destination both makes sense and doesn't feel bad. I still had Leonardo and Micaiah go north to get at least one kill from themselves, while Edward went to the chest room. Because Micaiah missed in the north and I needed Nolan to cover for her, I couldn't send Nolan to the chest room as well, so even though I made use of Shove to get Laura to reach the arrive point faster, I had to wait an extra turn for Edward to open both chests. Here we get the Tani, a light tome for Micaiah that is accurate and effective against both armored and mounted units, like the rapier of past games. Despite successfully getting the medicine, Micaiah finds herself captured by the Benyon soldier Jared and is now imprisoned. Soph breaks her out of her cell, and the Dom Brigade now has to escape alongside three other prisoners. Two are non-combatants, and we have to separately command their AI to guide them to the escape point. The third, however, is Ileana, who gets to show off her solid magical combat against the handful of knights on the map. I have Soth and Nolan lead the group, with Micaiah and Edward picking up kills from the back. The open middle area seems to make this difficult, but again, by looking up enemies' AI and knowing which enemies are stationary, it actually wasn't that bad. After a turn, some reinforcements appear there, including Aran, a soldier that Laura can recruit. Like the rest of the Dom Brigade, he is a fairly underwhelming physical combat unit, but he has plenty of room to grow. He may not be as bulky as Nolan or as fast as Edward, but he can at least use the 1-2 range javelin, which allows for more flexible positioning. After the central open area, the boss starts approaching. A strong cavalier normally might sound threatening, but Micaiah makes quick work of him with the Tawny. I was quick to pull the trigger on that kill, and the follow-up turn for that turn was a little messy. Thankfully, the enemy AI seemed to prefer not facing a counterattack than getting destroyed by Micaiah, even though they totally would have killed her before she had the chance to counterattack. Oh well, we take those. The rest of the game notwithstanding, Radiant Dawn's starting cast is a pretty solid version of getting units with manageable combat that have to all be used to get past the tough enemies. Radiant Dawn adds to this challenge by having interesting maps, which makes the cast feel a bit more fun as you have to use their standout features in tactical ways. For example, Leonardo is solid even as a typical early game weak archer, being able to do chip damage without getting countered. Edward and Nolan serve as your only standard combat units, so you need to position them well to keep all your units safe while still getting kills. Micaiah and Ileana serve as this main drawing force behind the need for defensive formations, but their solid offenses make it worth your time. Soth is another strong unit that can carry much of a map's combat, as we saw in Chapter 2. Here though, the maps make it both so you're encouraged to use them and not feel bad about it, while the other units actually get something relevant to do. This is especially true in Chapter 3, in which I've been using him as simply one part of defensive formations, and only occasionally getting kills when necessary. There are even some enemies he doesn't one round with a bronze dagger, such as the knights. Combined with the great presentation and incorporation of characters into a thought-provoking story, I think this makes Soth and the rest of the cast really solid. We'll see a pretty strong change in direction in the next parts, but for now, we'll let the Dom Brigade trainees have their moment. The ending of the map wasn't overly difficult, with a bunch of enemies to fight at a choke point. You could get through it faster if you just let Soth get a couple of kills, but I figured I could take the extra turn setting up kills for units like Eren instead. The escape point is just past the choke point, but you are rewarded if you wait for the other prisoners to escape first. You can also get a hidden item if you wait on a specific tile that's a couple turns away from the escape point. I have so through that task, earning us our first coin. It wastes at least a few turns to get, and it doesn't even do all that much, but as a completionist I saw no other choice but to retrieve it. Shadow Dragon. Once again, we find ourselves with Marth, clearing out pirates in the town of Galder. 
I expected that, much like Chapter 1, the slight increase in enemy stats would make for an experience that was even more rough than the original. To my surprise, it actually went pretty well. There are actually less enemies in the northeastern corner, and Akuma just straight up one rounded the thieves by accident this time. I still sent Kane up to try to get some XP, but since there was no healing AI thief to waste his time on, he was able to catch up with the rest of the group in the west. The highlight of this map was definitely Daros, who, unlike the original, is capable of talking to Marth and recruiting himself on the enemy phase. This happens at the start of the phase, and enemies will attack into him, but my Daros nailed a 1% crit for the kill. The enemies really outplayed themselves here. While everyone's performance against the pirates was worse than the original, I was at least expecting it, so teaming up to 3-shot the pirates didn't feel as bad this time. Sheeta and Drog having javelins helped set up kills, even when positioning was tight around the choke points. Ogma and Kane being around was also beneficial, as I essentially had my whole army available, with only 2-4 to four enemies to take care of at a time. Kane got great levels too, so that may have helped put me in a good mood when playing. Obviously, the cast of Shadow Dragon is the same as its original, only making a few slight changes to units themselves. Sheeta only having glances makes her feel a little worse when fighting the pirates, but I know her awesome personal effective weapon, the Wing Spear, more than makes up for it. Drog is in a similar position, but more so for the new freedom in positioning that the Javelin allows for a unit with low movement. Other than that, the main differences comes from the difficulty that Shadow Dragon's hard mode adds. It certainly makes the units perform worse, but it adds a level of tactical thinking when using the units, so I think that the units still feel good to use, just for different reasons. For example, Gordon's chip damage is actually useful, like Leonardo in Radiant Dawn, and Agma having great combat is much more appreciated. The simple nature of combat still makes units like Kane, Abel, and even the fighters a little underwhelming, but they are certainly usable, and allow for a satisfying training arc. The improved presentation of Shadow Dragon does the cast a lot of favors as well. They aren't incorporated into a deep story, but you can at least see a modernly styled character portrait when hovering over units, so you get a better sense of who they are, and whether or not you like them. The added support conversations will help them out a lot in the future, and even now we get some added dialogue between Marth and Castor, and Sheeta and Agma. Still not the most exciting cast, but a big improvement over the original, for sure. Halfway through the map, we now see one of Shadow Dragon's new features, mid-map save points. These are really nice, as they give the player an opportunity to save after clearing out major waves of the map before taking on the next, meaning you never have to repeat any individual sections of the maps. This is true if emulating and using save states, but that's something you do outside of the game, and thus feels like you're giving yourself an unfair advantage. These save points are fully intentional and limited though, making them feel satisfying to use. I never ended up having to reset, but I fully could have at the end. I realized that the boss was going to be ridiculous to beat with just iron swords and javelins like I did in chapter 1, since this boss has a 1-2 range hand axe. I opted for the silver lance on Jagan, and since he landed I decided to keep pushing for damage, landing several 60 and 80% hits, killing in one player phase. Had I missed, I just would have used the save point and taken it a bit slower. Martha wasn't actually ready to seize by then, since I held him back a couple turns ago to get a kill, so either way I would have seized on the same turn. New Mystery of the Emblem the next four chapters will finish off the prologue for New Mystery, and we start off by getting lost in the woods. Much like the previous games, this ultimately serves as an opportunity for our platoon in training to jump into a battle to selflessly save a village from being attacked by bandits. As with the other New Mystery prologue maps, there aren't too many enemies, but they make up for quantity with quality. Units like Roderick and Ryan don't have great combat, but our new unit, Athena, is super strong, being able to double everything, oftentimes getting the kill. I utilize Athena by having her pick off enemies whenever I feel overwhelmed, rather than killing everything herself for the sake of the quickest clear possible. I didn't use Sheeta in the last map, but I'm realizing now that she's actually really fast, but weak enough to actually set up kills for others sometimes. I'm still focusing my efforts on training Luke, and now even Ryan, 
as I'm scarred from Mystery of the Emblems Chapter 2, and I want the archers to be as strong as possible. After a turn, the mage Merrick joins, with stats roughly on par with Queen. Most importantly, he brings the long-awaited second Fire Tome, so I don't have to worry about running out of fire uses anymore. Thank goodness. After he helps clear out the first wave of enemies, the map is basically over, and I just run Luke down to kill the boss. Prologue 6 has their platoon fighting in a mock battle against Drog, and the map is back to being too small to move out of range of the, like, two enemies. <laughs> to compensate for our now large army, we unlock the preparation screen, and have to choose four units to deploy alongside Queen. Additionally, Cecile joins at the start of the map. Like Merrick, her main contribution in my run is bringing weapons, including a whole set of steel weapons and an Elfire. Using the new Elfire, Queen can set up the soldier kill for Ryan in the north, clearing the way for Athena to kill the archer, while Merrick sets up the soldier kill for Luke in the south. With this setup, Drog and the remaining mage can't team up to kill anyone, and I'm able to win the next turn with Queen setting up the Drog kill for Luke, and Cecile setting up the mage kill for Ryan. As our final exam before becoming official knights, Prologue 7 is back to being only moderately small, and it yet again still features choke points to fight the limited number of enemies. I'm easily able to get past the first couple enemies, setting up kills for Luke and Ryan. The main challenge comes from the reinforcements, which appear to be this map's tutorial. The boss, Kane, does hit at them, but these give a harsh introduction to same turn reinforcements, which can act and kill your units right after showing up. These are widely considered to be an unfair element of Fire Emblem, and I would agree that they dramatically take away from the experience of games that include them. At least here, they're fairly weak, and my units are able to survive, meaning no resets. I tried to bait Kane to my group turn 2, but he did not move, so I took the opportunity to have Luke and Cheetah run up to him instead, trapping him and defeating him over a couple turns. Having completed our final exam with flying colors, Queen's Platoon now prepares to be officially appointed knights. I should mention that between these last prologues, our technician Katarina has been asking us some questions, in which the player gets to input a yes or no. I've been choosing the polite responses, saying that of course we can be friends, and of course I trust you. When Katarina asks us whether or not we'll put on this totally not suspicious headband though, I of course say absolutely not. I have no idea whether these responses have any impact on the gameplay, but my suspicions are proven correct as Prologue 8 sees Katarina betraying our platoon during the ceremony and partaking in an assassination attempt on the king, Marth. This map certainly lives up to its position as a final map. There are some thieves that start right on top of you. The barbarians are pretty bulky with a mixture of silver and hand axes. Katarina hits our units really hard with the L fire, and the same turn reinforcements just keep on coming. The saving grace is that there is a save point in the middle of the map meaning you can reset right before taking on Katarina if the reinforcements snipe any of your units. You also get to deploy a whole 8 units, in addition to Marth and Kane joining your army. Marth isn't particularly outstanding, but he can definitely contribute to 2 or 3 shotting enemies, and taking a couple hits. Kane is pretty solid though, being a bit better than Luke, although higher leveled. I start off by killing the thief on the left with Queen and Ryan, but I leave the thief on the right alive since you can't attack them without being in range of a barbarian and an archer. Instead, I create a defensive formation to keep the thief from reaching Queen or Ryan. The next turn, I have my whole army around to kill the barbarian and two archers. 
As the last challenge before reaching the save point, there is another barbarian and a couple major reinforcements. Athena and Sheeta continue to be amazing, as they can still double and take out problematic enemies when necessary. Athena doesn't one round everything anymore, though I can have her set up kills for Queen, Luke, and Ryan. Looking back at the prologue as a whole, I think this was a really exciting way to show off a starting cast. By breaking up the maps for the sake of more isolated tutorials, you end up getting a constant but limited influx of new characters, so they all get their own introduction. Also, there is an interesting dynamic between the new mystery original characters and the Shadow Dragon returnees like Shida and Athena. The new mystery characters are fun to train, and unless you're playing on the highest difficulties, they seem to be reasonable to deploy while still making for challenging gameplay. The Shadow Dragon characters are much stronger, but because they leave your army at the end of the prologue, you're incentivized to only use them when necessary. Even if you do have them kill everything though, I imagine they rejoin later in the campaign, and they still get decent experience as unpromoted units, so it feels more like using Soth in Radiant Dawn, rather than Titania in Path of Radiance. The Avatar stands out as a super interesting unit, having a variety of starting class options that immediately make an impact on the gameplay. I'm obviously biased in the mage choice since I enjoy using mages, but this just exemplifies how any player can use their favorite class right from the start. Again, if you're not playing on the highest difficulty, I believe you can make any option work, so the game won't punish you for having fun. The main downside I observed for the starting cast is the limited deployment sizes. Also, some characters only joined at the end of a chapter, so even though they still got a scene to introduce them, it's possible, and likely, for players to never have draw get used. I also felt bad for Roderick, who I couldn't justify deploying in light of already spending deployment slots on Luke and Ryan. Perhaps we'll get an opportunity to train him back up in Chapter 1, but I suspect that his combat will be too far behind, and I'll need to rely on Luke to handle most of the combat. So basically, sad for Roderick, but great for me as a Luke enjoyer. Unlike Shadow Dragon, I do have to reset at the save point here, as the Thief reinforcements are able to team up with the other thieves around Katarina to kill Luke. Knowing that they were coming, I made a safer formation, taking advantage of the fact that they prefer to attack Athena and Sheeta since they have less defense, despite units like Luke and Kane being at low HP. In fact, Sheeta straight up one round the two of the thieves, setting up the victory next turn. I tried to set up the Katarina kill for Luke, but Kane just straight up crit. I like Kane a lot too though, so I'm okay with that. After we successfully fend off the assassination attempt, Katarina escapes, but Queen assures everyone that she must have a tragic backstory and will be redeemable in the main game. Our platoon then gets assigned as Marth's personal guard, and the strong units like Athena and Cheetah say that they are needed elsewhere, setting us up to mirror the opening of Mystery of the Emblem. Hopefully, with a stronger Luke and Ryan, we'll be able to handle the upcoming rough maps despite the increase in enemy quality. Just please, let Ryan be able to move two tiles at a time through the forests. Awakening. Despite saving the people of Southtown in the previous part, Crom insists that the Shepherds set up camp in the woods. While minding our own business eating bear meat, we get ambushed by some risen creatures that appear out of a mysterious portal in the sky. A masked figure saves Lyssa in the cutscene, but we're on our own for the battle itself. As with a lot of Awakening maps, the layout is pretty open, but the map clearly directs you to have your units sit on the forts and let the enemies come to you. As promised in the last part, I gave Frederick to Krom this chapter, in an attempt to boost his combat and let him get a ton of kills. This made him bulky enough to not even need the fort, but it made him so bulky that the enemies preferred to attack Queen, who killed most of the enemies that Krom had weakened. Unfortunate, but I don't plan to use many of the other early game units long term anyways, so he'll have more opportunities to get levels in the future. Speaking of early game units, the Cavalier Sully and the Archer Virion join on turn 2. Unlike the other games, this is actually a wave of new units that aren't incredibly impactful upon joining, as Queen, Krom, and Frederick can do completely fine on their own. They also don't do particularly well against the enemies without having a strong pair up like Frederick, or the level advantage like Queen, so I just have them sit out of range of the enemies.
Soli almost contributed something by providing enough chip damage to set up a kill for Krom against the boss while using Queen support over Frederick. I was incorrect in assuming that the Bronze Sword was weaker than the Bronze Lance, though, and by taking Frederick away from Krom, Soli was too strong. I decided to just wait a turn, rather than let Soli get the kill. Afterwards, the masked figure introduces themselves as Marth, but we will have to wait until next part in Shadow Dragon to play as Marth, as the masked figure leaves us yet again. We next return to the capital of Elis, where Krom, revealed to be the prince, reconvenes with the rest of the shepherds. The clumsy Pegasus knight Sumia decides to wait a chapter until she's ready to fight in an actual battle, but we still get three new units in our army. On their way to the kingdom of Regna Ferox, they encounter more Risen, and unlike Chapter 1, we actually need all hands on deck this time. Stahl, another standard cavalier, and Vake, a fighter, join right from the start, and having more units to attack and create defensive lines is very appreciated, even if their combat isn't super impressive at base. In fact, Vake doesn't even have a weapon in his starting inventory, which I suppose is meant to serve as a tutorial for trading. Regardless, he can contribute by pairing up with another unit and providing a great boost to strength and defense. I pair up Vake with Krom and Frederick with Soli, getting the first Soldier and Barbarian kills turn 1. The next turn, Muriel shows up, a mage that's frail, but has some amazing late game potential and solid early game contributions in shipping with magic at 2 range. She also brings Vake's axe, but as I have paired him up with Krom, I don't bother trading. Instead, I just focus on getting kills to Krom, Queen, and Stahl, while staying safe from the multitude of enemies in an open field. I'm able to create a formation turn 2 that prevents the two surviving enemies from teaming up on any given unit. As we can see from these hectic first couple of turns, Awakening does encourage you to use most of, if not all, the available units at first. Paired with a colorful introduction to each character that demonstrates their gimmick, this seems to make for a great opening cast. As we get more characters, players will be able to gauge for themselves, based on both narrative and gameplay, which units they would like to continue using. Additionally, while most units have pretty standard, if not underwhelming combat at base, the pair-up system is one aspect of Awakening that lets you make anyone great. As we've seen, Frederick makes everyone bulky and strong, and Krom can let a lot of units push for lethal kills with a high chance to proc dual strikes. The downside of pair-up, however, is that pair-up is so strong that it's usually beneficial to have almost every unit paired up, meaning approximately 50% of the cast doesn't actually get a chance to shine. Don't get me wrong, I respect Vague for that plus 4 strength, plus 2 defense pair-up, but I don't particularly like him as a character, and the game has never encouraged me to try using him as the lead unit. Ultimately, it seems most new players end up picking who to use based on character design alone. It's better than having almost nothing to go off of, like in Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, but it does hurt the starting cast of Awakening, as they are all low-leveled units that need immediate training to prevent falling off too hard, but the game discourages you from training too many of them by making pair-ups so good. For example, in Chapter 2, Muriel is already not providing too much chip damage, and pairing up with the Avatar is a good play as they might actually be able to double some enemies. Muriel wants a speed level up to double the knights as soon as chapter 3 though, meaning if you want her to be good, she needs to start trading right away. I didn't plan for this to be a Muriel heavy run though, so after dealing with the scary open field, I let her and several units get left behind for a turn, while Krom takes the choke point at the bridge alongside Soli and Stahl. Here, he's finally able to get the kills that I've been promising him. After pushing through, I do some pair-up shenanigans to get Queen up to the boss with a Muriel pair-up, and with her and Stahl's attacks, I'm able to weaken the boss for another Krom kill.
Fates. Like New Mystery, this part will wrap up the prologue. We begin in Noor with our totally not evil father, Garen, sending us on a mission to secure a supposedly abandoned fortress. Our totally not evil assistant, Hans, provokes the Hoshiden soldiers we discover at the fortress, and as a representation of the rest of Fates, we assume that we have no choice but to kill everyone to solve our problems. Other than Hans, who acts on his own as a green unit, our army is the same from Chapter 2, but there is a lot more ground to cover. We just need to seize the gate in the southeastern corner, but there are three potential paths to reach it. The first is the pre-existing bridge in the north, but Hans quickly crosses off that option, as he gets obliterated by the samurai and archers awaiting at the end. It is technically possible to push through them, but it's not really worth the effort. Instead, you are encouraged to use a dragon vein to create a stone bridge. The southernmost one seems to avoid the most enemies, but you can get more easily ambushed by the Sky Knight reinforcements in that path. I take the centermost path instead, as I actively wish to fight as many enemies as possible for maximum XP. Before heading down though, there are a couple samurai to fight. Normally Jacob and Queen can kill them with each other's dual strikes, but with the Strength Bane, they fall short and I have to leave Jacob behind to finish them off, while Queen pairs up with Gunter to quickly activate the Dragon Bane. The rest of the map becomes a very tedious dance with the archers, in which I bait over a couple, trade Gunter around to get kills while keeping both Queen and Jacob safe, then back off to avoid getting overwhelmed and heal up before doing it all over again. I also take a detour to kill the stationary archers at the fort across the northern bridge, before finally heading down to the boss. My Jacob has gotten enough speed to avoid getting doubled, and with the Gunter pair up, he's actually very tanky, so I just have Jacob sit in front of the boss and slowly ship him down, while Queen struggles against the Sky Knight reinforcements. With Jacob's defensive aura skills, she doesn't take any damage, and the Sky Knights will ignore her, but without them she gets doubled and takes a solid amount of damage. I end up having to have her wait next to Jacob and let him get all the kills, just in time for the boss kill and subsequent Cs. After the battle, Hans continues to create chaos, throwing Gunter and Queen off the bridge into a deep chasm. Our maid, Lilith, reveals herself to actually be a dragon, and flies down to rescue us, introducing the astral plane before returning us to the real world. We wake up to find ourselves in Hoshido, where our mother Mikoto, Ryoma, and even Rinka and Kaze from Chapter 2 welcome us with open arms. The touching moment is interrupted as we are swept into a battle to save our siblings, Hinoka and Sakura, from a group of faceless monsters. As a contrast to the interesting maps that introduced the Norian characters, this shows off the Hoshiden characters in a pretty rough situation. The terrain is covered in forests and mountains, and while you were intended to use the Dragon Veins to remove the mountains, this opens up your frailer units to being attacked by the faceless, and without any healers, the damage adds up quickly. Clearing the mountains also encourages the green unit, Ryoma, to follow your group and obliterate everything you would have fought, which can be representative of the birthright routes, but it's frustrating here because you don't even have a choice to hold him back. This is doubly frustrating because our new Hoshiden units are actually kind of fun to use. Kaze is a ninja, so like Jacob, he has shurikens, meaning solid 1-2 range and debuffs. Rinka, the primary Oni Savage of the game, is actually kind of bulky, and she encourages you to monitor her health to keep her damage boosting personal skill active. I have Queen visit the village turn 1, then Kaze and Rinka perform the classic combo for this map. Kaze pairs up with Rinka to give her an extra point of movement, 
she moves forward, switches to Kaze, and Kaze separates Rinka forward, moving maximum distance to cope with how much the terrain restricts her movement. If you're only planning to play the Conquest route, there's no reason to train Rinka, and the challenge becomes soloing the map with the Avatar and Kaze. Since we're playing all the routes, I attempt to train Rinka and Kaze equally, having them team up for kills and use each other's dual strikes much like Queen and Jacob did in the previous maps. I avoided Ryoma breathing down my neck by not triggering the Dragon Veins, but this did mean that I got to Hinoka right as Sakura was defeated by a Faceless. This isn't of any consequence, as you can still talk to Hinoka to get a concoction, then move on to deal with the boss group on the central mountain. Again, they are just too strong to reasonably use the Dragon Bane, so I fight them in pairs, having Rinka walk on the mountain for added bulk and to keep the Faceless from being able to wrap around and attack Kaze. Rinka's hits rates have been frustrating this whole map, made even worse by the avoid bonuses of terrain, but she pulls through in this final stretch. With our sisters safe, we return to Hoshido and attempt to celebrate our return to our real home, but a mysterious figure attacks the city plaza, killing Mikoto and sending Queen into a draconic rage. Queen's new form has given her a significant boost in both power and level, meaning she can one-shot most of the enemies, but her XP gain has been drastically cut. As a result, we would like to focus on giving kills to Kaze and Rinka, but this is pretty difficult, as the enemy mercenaries are far too bulky and strong for them to handle in groups, and while Kaze has a decent matchup against the Dark Mages when paired up with Rinka, he didn't level strength enough to one-round them, and he's not bulky enough to handle two rounds of combat with all of them. Past the powered-up avatar, the map also gives you the new tools of a healer in Sakura, and a dancer-like unit in Azura. Sakura is more notable than the other healers in the series by having 1-2 range saves, and a personal skill that boosts the bulk of nearby allies. Azura is the star of the show, however, using her action to refresh another unit's action. This map sets up an obvious use for this, in which you have Azura sing for the Avatar, so they can kill several enemies before they have a chance to kill Kaze or hit the Avatar with an effective weapon. As for my strategy, I've always taken a large amount of turns to maximize Kaze and Rinka kills, but this run, I decided to just let Queen get kills when necessary, as intended. In doing so, Kaze only got a few kills, but I also got some kills to Rinka this way, who was usually stuck being paired up with Kaze. At one point, Sakura had to pair up with Kaze to give him the defensive capabilities of Guard Gauge, occasionally shielding him from the Dark Mage's attacks, so I didn't always have access to healing. I let the reinforcement Dark Mages that approached from all four corners of the map converge in the center, which was a little scary, but with tactical use of Guard Gauge, I stayed safe while pushing Queen forward to the boss. Ryoma had long since retreated, but Queen was able to get the two-shot. So far, we haven't actually seen the starting cast for each route, but rather have gotten glimpses at characters to come, in an effort to demonstrate what each route has to offer. In Conquest, you get to make tactical use of some fairly bulky units and interesting maps, while in Birthright, you are given the promise of Ryoma, a unit that can carry a bulk of the map on his own, while your other, frailer units take on enemies altogether. There are obviously different ways to engage with each game, but this is what the prologue is presenting. I think that the demonstration of the Conquest units played out a lot better. I had a lot of fun pairing Queen with Jacob to kill enemies, making use of his defensive boosting skills, and using dual strikes to get kills together. Kaze was also fun as a representative of the multitude of ninjas you get in Birthrights, but the maps didn't give him a chance to show off their full potential. Chapter 4 was just way too tedious, and he wasn't really meant to perform all too well in Chapter 5, though he does make a valiant effort when fighting the Dark Mages, and it's exciting if he and Rinka can pick up some kills there. Exciting, but not in a way that makes them stand out as great, Rinka especially. At least Azura gets a great introduction, joining in a situation that shows off the specific power of refreshers to maximize the power of your strongest units.
With the battle won, Azura is able to calm Queen down. We now get the legendary sword, Yato, and Azura gives Queen a Dragonstone so she can control herself when she transforms into a dragon. Yet another point in Azura's favor, as we'll soon get to see how awesome the Dragonstone is in the next part, finally making use of the Magic Boon, and freeing us from the restrictions of the Funny Strength Bane. Shadows of Valentia. Just like in Gaiden, Alm's group takes a side mission to the Thief Shrine, though this time with some dialogue from Alm and Grey pointing it out. Here we see the expanded dungeons of Shadows of Valentia. You still get to move Alm around, but the 3D environment is much more expansive, and the encounters are tied to enemies that patrol the area, which you can either strike to gain a slight advantage, or just ignore altogether. There are also breakable objects that may drop basic items, alongside chests that have strong weapons or equipment. In Thief Shrine, we get an Iron Sword, which basically gives plus 2 attack. A simple boost, but it can be helpful for getting the villagers to pick off kills. While I am aiming for the Blitzkrieg award, which requires you to complete the game in under 500 turns, I am not completely limiting myself from doing these theoretically optional encounters. I may do one or two per dungeon, to mirror the gameplay of Gaiden. To maximize experience, I gather all three encounters in the dungeon together, then strike, letting me fight all three trios of brigands in one battle. Unlike Gaiden, these enemies do not have healing AI, so after they all weaken themselves against Alm, Lucas, and Grey, they let themselves get killed by Grey on the enemy phase. By having Faye around for the action, I don't actually kill them all in the second enemy phase, needing an extra turn to finish one off. It'll be worth it though, since even though the villagers are already at level 3, it is possible that they can get a stat over class bases, which we'll see once we get to the middle idol. Before then though, we first have to fight the brigand boss and his army of, well, brigands. This is a Shadows of Valentia original battle, which you can tell from the Defeat Commander victory condition, which is quite the rarity in Gaiden. You can charge the brigand boss right away, but if you want more experience, you can wrap around the sides first, splitting into two groups. I have Alm, Lucas, and Fey go right, while Grey leads Tobin and Cliff to the left. Lucas takes on the important role of baiting the archer, which also gets the boss moving. From there, Lucas and Alm chip him down over a couple of combats, but I'm unable to set up the kill for Fey. All around, the experience management was a little awkward, as many of the villagers got far past level 3 or 4, but ran out of enemies before they could get the next level. This isn't a huge deal though, since most units have their important stats brought up to a certain level upon promotion anyways. The main frustration was that Cliff could have actually gotten level 4, and maybe an additional point of skill or something, but he missed a lethal attack on the final turn, despite having unlocked the hit boosting support with Tobin, and getting a whopping 95 hit. Unfortunate. After beating Brigand Boss, we are finally able to recruit Silk. Spells still have their hit rates capped, with Nosferatu at 60, and her eventual warp spell has its range limited in Shadows of Valentia, but she at least gets XP for healing now, and with units taking more damage, her healing is more important. The other reward, of course, is access to the Mila Idol. To be consistent with Gaiden, I promote Grey to Mercenary and Tobin to Archer. Skipping past Cliff for a moment, most people would suggest Cleric for Fey, giving you another healer and having access to unique spells like Physic and Rescue. Sometimes, this utility can mean that you can push your combat units forward faster. Alternatively, if you can get away with not needing this healing, then an extra combat unit is actually more efficient. Following this logic, I'll be choosing Mage for Fey. She gets some strong spells, and her support with Alm gives her a huge boost in hit rate, letting her actually reach 100% hit with magic. Additionally, the base speed for female mages is 7, while male mages such as Cliff only get brought up to 4. This means that even without any speed fountains, they can double enemies right from the start. Doubling up on mages isn't a bad idea, but for the sake of having a fun, diverse cast, I choose Cavalier for Cliff. 
I don't care about the first cavalier you recruit, and Cliff's great speed growth will let Cliff surpass him anyway. I give two speed fountains to Silk, so she can avoid getting doubled for a few chapters while I try to train her, and I give the other to Faye, so she can continue doubling for longer. The flow of Ram Valley goes about the same, sending everyone up the path, then backtracking a couple units to handle the Leather Shield mercenary. This time, the slightly different unit composition, larger amounts of enemies, and increase in enemy stats makes it a bit different. For one, Faye leveled up strength on all her first level ups, so she can actually one round the brigands. She could only live a few hits though, so she isn't able to kill them all in Alm's name like she would hope. Rather, I have her kill some problematic enemies on player phase, such as the archer, then block her off with the bulkier physical units. This time, this includes Cliff, who is able to catch up with his high movement despite being in the back, and actually being fairly tanky. By conserving phase HP, Silk is free to fish for hits, getting a kill or two. While Cliff, Grey, and Lucas hold down the second wave of enemies in the east, I send Alm and Fay back to the mercenary a bit earlier. Being stronger, I really didn't want him to get off the mountain, as I'll be unable to hold a defensive formation against him for long. Instead, I have Alm sit at the bottom of the mountain, preventing him from moving off and reaching Fay, who can take her time three-shotting him. Thankfully, magic ignores terrain in this game, or else we'd be here for a while. Alm avoids the danger of getting crit by healing with the provisions that Shadows of Valentia added. Despite the mechanical similarities to Gaiden, I felt Shadows of Valentia made a lot of improvements for a starting cast. The Vilcher training arc feels more tactical, since you can more easily do calculations. It's also a little more involved with the hard mode boosted enemies, but because of the higher levels, you get rewarded with more XP for taking the time to figure out a kill. As mentioned in part 1, Faye also makes the maps a bit more tight if you want her and Cliff to get to level 3 without grinding, or to get level 4 for a chance to surpass certain class bases. Faye having some new villager options is also cool. Pegasus Knight is underwhelming, not having great utility and having bad combat for her, and Cavalier is just kind of boring for everyone if you're using the default Cavaliers that join later. But the extra healing from Cleric and the speedy female mage makes the maps a lot more enjoyable. Of course, as with the other remakes, the improved presentation made the cast feel much more alive, and this is especially true with Shadows of Valentia and the heavily expanded narrative. Even past Rem Village, Grey and Tobin will continue to make appearances, and everyone gets additional dialogue through the added support conversations. Let's just not touch on that unfortunate on face support, and focus on how Mage Fae could one round the brigands instead. Three Houses Having helped fend off Kostas' group of bandits, the three house leaders are quick to show off their positions as the future rulers of Fodlin's different nations, and convince us to join their forces. Before definitively choosing a side though, we are taken back to Garrick Mach Monastery, where the Archbishop, Rhea, offers us a position as a professor. Here we get an opportunity to walk around the monastery and get a preview of the students you will recruit from each house. I will be going with the Black Eagles, led by the future Emperor of Adressia, Edelgard. After choosing our house, we get a day of forced exploration of the monastery. I won't be showing off every detail of the monastery in this run for brevity's sake, but I will be spending too much time optimizing it, and I'll point out when important changes come from it. This week, the highlight is resetting for Nordsalot seeds, which can be planted at the greenhouse for a lot of professor rank points and potentially some speed stat boosters. 
Our first mission as Professor is to lead the house in a mock battle against the other houses. To ease the player into learning the game's mechanics, Chapter 1 restricts deployment to only 5 units, and two of them must be the Avatar and the House Leader. Queen and Edelgard are both pretty strong and can contribute to getting 3 or potentially 2 shots against the enemies here. For the other 3 units, there is some contention in whether to stick with the best options, or to just bring units you want to train. Lenhardt's healing isn't strictly necessary if you take the map slowly and wrap around the left, but he makes charging through the center much more realistic, so I'll be deploying him. Bernadetta is another solid option, having Curve Shot, a combat art that lets her attack with bows at 3 range, and with added hit. Getting a head start on training her is also nice, since as an archer, she will often be weakening enemies, rather than getting kills, so she's my second pick. For the third, having someone who can finish kills alongside Queen and Edelgard would be nice. Ferdinand and Petra fill this role well, with Ferdinand having the powerful Tempest Lance combat art, and Petra being a bit weaker while having the speed to avoid getting doubled by most enemies. In my bias though, I will be deploying Kaspar. He's not particularly strong, even with the Smash combat art, and unless he unequips his weapon, he gets doubled by most enemies. I want him to be good though, and the extra push this map gives to getting promoted by Chapter 3 is much appreciated for him. The other Black Eagle students include Hubert and Dorothea. Their main draw for Chapter 1 is having fairly strong magic, which can help defeat the physically bulky Dudu and Dimitri. Because spells have limited uses per map in three houses, they can only attack four or five times before switching to physical weapons, which do little to zero damage in the hands of the mages. Dudu and Dimitri are certainly beatable without them, making them mostly useless here. I'll be training all the Black Eagles this run, so they will have their time to shine, but it just won't be now. Looking at the map, we see two different options. First, we could take on the Golden Deer in the west, regroup at the heel tile, then move east to take on the Blue Lions. This is the safer option, but to beat the map faster, we will be taking on both houses at once in the middle. They don't actually fight each other, so when they meet up in the center, we'll have quite the mess on our hands. This is the main reason I would not recommend this strategy on Maddening, especially since we have no rewind mechanic yet, and the RNG can be kinda crazy, with low crit chances everywhere, and hit rates not being the best. Having played this map on Maddening 9 times though, I have a good idea on how to approach the enemy formations. Starting off, Queen baits Lorenz, while Edelgard baits Ash with the Iron Bow. Because she's so strong, Edelgard sets up the kill for Kaspar, but of course only getting the kill after moving Queen to chip Lorenz, providing Kaspar the Professor's Guidance boost to XP. After Edelgard weakens Lorenz, Bernadetta takes Byleth's Iron Bow to kill Lorenz with Curve Shot, also getting Professor's Guidance. Trading around the bows is a big component of this chapter, letting units avoid counterattacks and allowing for better positioning. Because Bernadetta is so frail, Ignatz chose to attack her even though she can counterattack him, so Edelgard was easily able to set up the kill for Bernadetta next turn, while getting Professor's Guidance, of course. Next, I have Queen sit in a forest and bait to do. By forcing him to attack rather than wait, we avoid him activating his personal skill that increases his defense by 4, which would make our physical units barely scratch him. Without it, I'm able to defeat him with my whole army, trading around the bow to avoid anyone being in range of Dimitri. The following turn, I'm able to beat Dimitri with my whole army, just like they do. Mercedes follows Dimitri, but with a training bow, she's hilariously weak compared to the other enemies, and she even fails to kill Bernadetta, leaving her at 1 HP. We don't even have vengeance yet, but Bernadetta already knows what's up.
Once again, because the enemy archer chose to attack into our own archer, we can easily finish them off the following turn. I tried to set up the kill for Caspar, but Bernadette procs her crest, getting an extra attack and sealing the kill for herself. This isn't particularly bad, but the lack of Professor's Guidance did make me cringe. While we've been dealing with the Blue Lions, Hanneman has been moving west, coincidentally meeting up with the Golden Deer, and leading the charge in what I like to call Chapter 1's Congo Line. Four units charging at your army of five is very scary, and this is where the extra damage or speed from Ferdinand and Petra would be appreciated. While dealing with Mercedes, I move everyone back so that Hanneman attacks into Queen, who can counter with the Iron Bow, for two turns. This sets up for a turn where I can kill both Hanneman and Claude, heal Queen, and trade Caspar the larger training sword, so no one can die to Hilda and Manuela. Edelgard and Queen could have exactly two-shot Claude, but Edelgard crit, making for the second stolen kill this map. The following turn, I'm able to set up the Hilda kill for Caspar, with Bernadetta's curb shot getting around Hilda's 1-2 range hand axe. At this point, Caspar is already about to hit level 3, with everyone else not too far off themselves. With just Manuela left, there isn't really much to do than set up another kill for my unit of choosing. She's not very offensively threatening though, so we can even take a couple extra turns to chip her down, earning some class mastery points and weapon XP. Most players would be satisfied with this, but I won't let it stop here. Manuela only has 6 Nosferatu uses, and once she's out, she stays in place, and even will use her droppable vulnerary. After luring her into a forest, I can have Caspar and Linhart repeatedly attack with training swords, dealing minuscule damage. This goes on for about 10 turns, until she finally runs out of vulneraries, and no one other than Linhart can attack without killing. The rewards for this mid-chapter mini-grinding session is getting Caspar and Linhart to have almost mastered their noble class, despite not actually getting many actions in this map, along with a handful of weapon rank with swords. It's not nearly worth it if you care about turn counts, and there are plenty of opportunities for grinding in the future, but I think this instance is funny, since we haven't even unlocked the grindy auxiliary battles yet. Overall, Three Houses has a very obviously unique approach to a starting cast. The prologue lets you try out all the house leaders, and you get to meet the rest of the characters while exploring the monastery for the first time. Getting to choose which units you start with is cool, and these in-depth introductions let the player make an actually informed decision. Even disregarding the choosing of a house, just the structure of getting 8 new units all at once makes three houses stand out, for better or for worse. <laughs> Chapter 1 at least attempts to ease you into the new units by making you use only half of them, giving you a chance to give your favorite units a head start. You can go out of your way to recruit most of the other characters in the early and mid game, but once you get halfway, you're basically done with new units. This gives the starting cast a huge identity as the core of your army, with supplemental units being added as you play the first dozen chapters. The main downside I find with this cast is the performance in the early game of Maddening. It is a no fault of the units themselves, but the enemy quality is just ridiculously strong, and most of your units can't hope to hold up, making them feel bad as a whole, as you have to go all in on precise calculations and positioning to get past challenges, such as Chapter 1's Congo Line. This kind of wraps around to making Edelgard and the Avatar feel great, as there's a sense of satisfaction in seeing that they can actually get two shots. Everyone else really struggles though, and it's going to take us until part 5 or so to turn this performance around. Fire Emblem, engage! With Clan and Fram safely rescued from the Corrupted, our mother, Queen Lumera, gives us a ride to Letho's castle. Here she explains the existence of the twelve emblem rings, half of which are here in Lethos, while the other six are scattered across the other four nations of Elios. We need to collect all of the emblems to be able to defeat the upcoming villain, Sombron, and to test our current strength, Lumera sets up a battle against her in the courtyard. Now that Clan and Fram have gotten their act together, we can actually command them now. Clan is a speedy and accurate mage, and while I do plan to use him in the future, 
His low magic makes him unenticing to train in the mage class, so I will hold off on his training arc until we have access to reclassing. Fram stands out as a healer by having access to the chain guard mechanic as a unit with a chi adapt tag. It's a little awkward to consistently set up, but it can occasionally be useful to block an enemy attack with her. The fight has two phases, starting very simply with only a couple enemies in the way of Lumera. The Axe Fighter is meant to teach the player about the new Break mechanic, in which the Weapon Triangle essentially makes disadvantaged units unable to counterattack, rather than providing a boost to hit, avoid, or damage. My goal is to set up all the kills for Queen, so I ignore the obvious Break, and have Vander and Clan weaken the enemy instead. This is essentially what I do for every enemy for the rest of the map, taking perhaps a couple more turns than you normally might if you just let Clan get some kills here and there. Lumera is pretty underwhelming in the first phase, as she moves away from her forest, and is easily killed by Vander into Queen, using Marth's Lodestar Rush. There's not even a reason to conserve engaging with Marth here, as for the second phase, Queen is forcefully unengaged, setting their engage meter to zero. Normally, they would have to wait for several more actions to build it back up and be able to engage again, but by moving on to the Emblem Energy tile, her meter is fully filled, and she is ready to engage the next turn. In the second phase, the enemies before Lumera are, once again, not a huge deal, as I take them one at a time to give kills to Queen. Lumera herself is a natural threat though, as she is now wielding the Sigurd Emblem Ring. We'll look at it more closely when we obtain it in the next part, but for now, it is suffice to say that Lumera gets a huge boost to movement, letting her jump our army with the Rider's Bane, doing a ton of damage to Vander, who has otherwise been shrugging off attacks. This puts pressure to win the next turn, but this proves to be a bit annoying. On the first attempt, I have Clan chip at 2 range to avoid risking a 1% crit, but he loses out on his personal skill that increases his hit rate when adjacent to Queen, and he misses an incredibly low 96% hit. On the successful attempt, I just risk the 1% crit to get a 100% hit, and Queen is able to finish with a Lodestar Rush. We have successfully passed our trial against Lumera, and are spending some quality time with Marth, but a sudden blast draws us back to the Ring Vault. An unknown human army is attempting to steal the Emblem Rings, and we have to get to the Vault as soon as possible to help Lumera protect them. The enemies outnumber our army by quite a bit, and we are ill-equipped to handle the waves of flyers coming from the sides. We have to try though, so I have Queen engage right away, defeating a Lance Fighter with Lodestar Rush, who otherwise would cause problems by breaking Queen. Vander waits in a position that encourages both swordfighters to move south, Fram using Chain Guard to ensure Vander doesn't get broken by the first, and can deal some damage with a counterattack. Turn 2, our army gets a much appreciated wave of reinforcements. Alfred, the Crown Prince of Fyrne, joins with his cute self, alongside his retainers Etier and Boucheron. Alfred's unique Lord class serves as a slow but relatively bulky cavalry class, and he is the first lance user of the army. Etier is an archer, and as a contrast to the other weak early game archers covered in this part, she actually has a great first impression, having a ton of flyers that she exactly one-shots in this map. Boucheron is a bit less exciting, with somewhat standard combat. As a fighter, he has the backup tag, meaning he provides an additional attack for 10% of an enemy's max HP when in range of an enemy that another unit is attacking. Later in the game, this can be incredibly useful, but for now, it's mostly situational. Etia starts the group off by shooting down the flyers that come in from the east. Queen kills a flyer coming from the west, while Clan and Alfred finish the sword fighters in the center. Of the new units, Alfred is the only one I plan to use long term, but for various reasons that we'll explore in future parts, I'm not pressed to get him a ton of kills on his join chapter. Getting kills when necessary won't hurt too much though, 
and with so many kills to get on the following player phases, everyone always has to contribute something, and even Clan has to pick up kills sometimes. After clearing out the first half of the map, I have Queen rest at the Emblem Energy, timing it so she could reach right after her three turns with Marth ran out. I also baited a sword fighter that turn, triggering all the enemies to start moving. Queen then re-engaged, one-shotting a sword fighter with Lodestar Rush, while Vander waited at the choke point in front of the boss, giving everyone else an extra turn to subdue all the other enemies. The following turn, Clan proves that he does indeed have meaningful early game contributions by one-rounding the boss when basically no one else can do damage. The victory condition is actually Rout, and I'm not able to defeat the final archer on player phase, but they end up getting themselves killed by attacking into the frailer clan. Something engaged as well is designing its maps around the new recruits. This shows in these early chapters, most obviously when FTA gets to shoot down flyers with exact lethal. Alfred and Boucheron are a little more boring with that standard combat, but they at least get sword and lance enemies to break, and having more solid combat units is appreciated in the moment after they join. They've mostly just been used to clear enemies with basic combat, and in our case to set up as many kills for Queen as reasonably possible, so they're not the most exciting unless you get hooked on their characters. Luckily, Alfred has a cutscene to establish himself, so making a connection with him isn't too difficult. Clan has been similarly underwhelming, though for different reasons. Being a mage is fun, but his low magic is already proving to be rough, as he can barely help with two-shotting enemies. Fram is conceptually cool with Chi Adept's chain guard mechanic, but she can only do this once before needing to heal herself, and she already wants to be healing every turn, so she also falls flat in standing out. Basically, I see the starting cast of Engage as having a solid introduction, but not much that would make them stand out past that one moment. As we get emblem rings and more engaging maps though, we'll get an opportunity to let our favorite units shine in more exciting ways. And that about wraps up our starting casts. Some are a bit more complete than others, but for the most part I've gotten to single out a couple units that I want to use in the long term, and give them the investment they need to succeed. Hopefully, I was able to give a comprehensive overview of the units we have so far, and I'll continue to give short introductions for new units as the marathon progresses. Overall, I was surprised to see that there's actually a lot of nuance between each game's early units, despite the surface level similarities of archetypes like the cavalier and fighter duos, and the weak archer. Presenting engaging characters is something I felt improved as the series progressed. I noticed a big jump when it came to genealogy, with the units starting to have more distinguishing features, and at least a decent introduction to their character. Likewise, Awakening marked a jump to a greater focus on character interactions, and as such, characters now have more obvious, distinguishable personalities. Sometimes they're a bit gimmicky and shallow, but the benefit is that players can have a stronger gut reaction as to which characters they want to use. All of the remakes, like Shadow Dragon, were a great improvement over their original game, but they were relatively limited considering their release time. Shadows of Valentia is an exception, of course, with a specific focus on improving the presentation and making the characters both entertaining and part of an interesting story. You might expect that with games getting more beginner-friendly as the series progressed, so too with the performance of the starting units. As evidenced by the contrast in this marathon of, say, Thracia and Three Houses, this is not exactly true. The addition of difficulty modes starting in Binding Blade usually means that the normal modes may let the starting cast perform well for the sake of new players, but the higher difficulty modes make the starting cast have a terrible start, fighting overleveled enemies before they've had a chance to grow. This made using units in Binding Blade, New Mystery of the Emblem, and Three Houses stressful to use, barely being able to contribute to three shots while constantly being in danger. I think Radiant Dawn and Fates had a much better balance, with units having some difficulty beating enemies, but being able to make use of tactical formations, or mechanics like dual strikes, to compensate. When it comes to entertainment, I understand that I'm obviously going to be biased in saying which games had the most fun units, but I can try to be objective and point out some elements of games that makes the units more interesting. Specifically, I'd argue that a fun unit has to stray in some way from the standard combat of just dealing decent damage at one range and being kind of bulky. A lot of the older games have this issue, with units' combat potential blending together, and not having anything all that interesting to accomplish. 
Thracia in particular was a little frustrating, despite the context of capturing making the weak enemies still interesting to engage with, as you had many low-level units with the training arc that was ultimately in contention with capturing. Sacred Stones and Path of Radiance also featured pretty standard units in Franz and Void with weak enemies to fight, and they had the additional issue of being overshadowed by powerful units that make them look bad in comparison. On the other hand, I think Radiant Dawn, New Mystery, and Shadows of Valentia had fun casts all around. I mention Radiant Dawn because Micaiah dropping the Tawny is such a cool power spike for her, and Soth is a useful and satisfying Seth-like unit that actually makes the maps fun to engage with. New Mystery's avatar, with a customizable base class, lets all players use their favorite class from the start, and the disparity between the New Mystery original characters and Shadow Dragon returnees makes them entertaining training projects, while still being reasonable to train. Outside the highest difficulty modes, of course. Gaiden and Shadows of Valentia give you the same class freedom as a New Mystery, but attaches it to several units, requiring an engaging training arc to reach it. In summation, I think that Shadows of Valentia hits the mark for the qualifiers of having engaging characters and both competent and entertaining units. This starting cast is one of the reasons that I think this game is so easy and fun to pick up, and I often find myself burning through all of Act 1 in one or two sittings as a result. Radiant Dawn also surprised me, with kind of basic units, but providing interesting maps to use them on, and being tied to an engaging story. Fates also did a good job at giving a preview of each route, and the units were fun to use even on Lunatic thanks to the cool new mechanics. Only having a few units on each map certainly limited how much I was able to enjoy using them, as they had to deal with large maps like Chapter 3 and Chapter 4, but once we start building our actual army in each route, this won't be a problem. With our teams now established, the next part will see each game go in their own directions as we get into gameplay that's more representative of each game. Now we can watch as my units of choosing become more dominant, hopefully including Luke and Ryan from Mystery of the Emblem and its remake, Faye from Shadows of Valentia, and Alfred from Engage. We'll also get to branch the Fates playthrough into all three routes, comparing the three different versions of Chapter 6, and see if New Mystery of the Emblem is able to fix its mountainous Chapter 1. Until then, you can vote for what topic you'd like to see for the next part in the community section. I'm trying to release these parts around once a month, but I'll also be uploading highlights and other short-form content once per week in the downtime. Let me know what your favorite early game units are in the comments, and if you enjoyed, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on the upcoming videos. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in part 3.